thank you. It's good to be here. Welcome to this talk. Uh, as my colleague mentioned, this talk is about login and access control. And I'm Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant. I'm doing a lot of Angular and I live in Austria. I also have a lot of customers in Germany and in other parts of the Union. I'm part of the Google Developer Expert team and I've written this book. It's, it's the book with the most ugly cover animal, but anyway, I'm quite proud of it. So what are the contents of this talk? Uh, I want to give a motivation to this topic and then I want to talk about OAuth 2. I want to show you what OAuth 2 is about. I will also talk about single sign-on with OpenID Connect. And in addition to that, we will also talk about social login, something like login with Facebook, login with Twitter, login with Google. After that, I have prepared a demonstration that shows everything I've told you before in action. And then we will also talk about single sign-out, a very underrated topic. Everyone is talking about single sign-on and no one is concentrating on single sign-out. So first things first, let's start with a motivation. Nowadays, every user has to access several applications on their devices. And each device needs access to several backend services. And in turn, the backend services are calling each other. And so all those parts of the system needs to know who the user is. The device itself needs to know it, the application, as well as all the backend services. And in addition to that, there are some requirements for this. For instance, we need the possibility that one service can delegate to another service and the service we are delegating to needs also to know who the user is, as mentioned. In addition to that, we need cross-origin requests. We need to include existing identity solutions like Active Directory or like something else, an LDAP system you have in your company. And we also want to make the identity solution exchangeable. We want to loosely couple to this identity solution uh, because each of our customer will have an own identity solution. And of course, our application has to work with them all. In addition to that, of course, we need single sign-on and also single sign-out. And we also want to protect from uh, attacks like cross-site request forgery attacks. It turns out that traditional solutions for authentication won't work that well with all the, that requirements. When we, for instance, look at HTTP basic, it won't work well because it doesn't work with single sign-on. It uh, doesn't allow you to protect the uh, password because the password is sent over time and again. And also cookies aren't a good fi fit for this because cookies don't allow for cross-origin requests, they don't allow for single sign-on, and uh, they have this issue that we have to protect from some attacks, like, as mentioned, cross-site request forgery attacks. So, more or less, we can forget about this. We need something better. And in general, it's a good idea when you need something better to look out in the real world. A good friend of me told me the real world is where the pizza boy comes from. I'm very thankful for this insight. And when we look in the real world, we see that there is something like a token exchange. For instance, yesterday, when I entered the airport, I showed them my passport and I got my flight ticket in turn. And this flight ticket gives me the permission to enter the security area of the airport. It also gives me the, the permission to went through the gate and to go into the plane. Of course, the permissions have been limited. This flight ticket didn't give me the permission to fly the plane and it also didn't give me the permission to start the boarding process. But I had this limited set of permissions that allowed me to get here to Poland. And now the question arises, how can we take this concept and put this concept into the world of single page applications? And the answer is, for this we need not two roles, but three roles. The first role is the client, your single page application. 
the second role is a so-called resource server, a server that provides a RESTful interface. And the third role is a so-called authorization server. The authorization server is the only role that knows all the users, that is capable of validating the users. And everything starts with the client redirecting the user to the authorization server. At the authorization server, the user can log in using a password, using some smart card, or just using Windows credentials when the user is part of a Windows domain. After this, the user is redirected back to the client, and as part of this redirection, the client gets an access token. With this access token, the client, of course, can access the resource server. So the client can use some uh, privileges of the current user at the backend. Perhaps not everything, but the client can act on behalf of the user and perform some use cases, use cases it is intended for. And this brings several advantages. One advantage is we can use one and only one central user account for each user. The user can use this user account to log into several clients and also to log into several resource servers. Only the authorization server sees the password. This is especially important when we don't trust our clients. Think about the consumer area where we download a lot of clients from the App Store or from the Internet. In this case, we don't want to put our password into each client, and so it's a good thing that we are redirected to the authorization server to type in our password. This could also be an important thing in business scenarios when you are buying another client, another client that should just walk with your, uh, work with your existing infrastructure. Another nice thing is that the authentication is decoupled from the client. That means that your client will work with all the authorization servers out there uh, when they are implementing some protocols. And this comes in handy when you are selling your application to several customers where each customer has its own identity solution, as mentioned. Tokens provide a lot of flexibility. For instance, one resource server can forward the token to another resource server. And so the other resource server knows who the current user is. And in addition to that, we don't have to use cookies, which is a workaround we are used to since years. And so we don't need to protect for from some attacks like cross-site request forgery attacks. Some people are telling me, yeah, Manfred, this is a good idea. Authorization servers are a good idea, but they add too much ceremony to the game. I'm saying no. They don't necessarily add some ceremony, additional ceremony to the game, because in the easiest scenario, an authorization server is just a bunch of additional endpoints. So normally, when we talk about the system, we think about these three roles, but when you simplify this, then you have just the two roles with an additional authorization endpoint, a REST service that is creating tokens. This is a very simple approach, and it can be a good starting approach when you don't have this central authentication server in your company. Of course, a central authentication server brings additional advantages like single sign-on. And it turns out that we don't have to reinvent the wheel because there are so much existing authorization servers out there. For instance, Federation Services, who sits on top of Active Directory, a product from Microsoft, exposes the whole Active Directory via this game. Or there is Identity Server for .NET, or Red Hat Keycloak for Java. There is Okta, which is an identity as a service solution, a cloud-based solution you can use to get started very quickly. There is Auth0, Auth0 is doing the same. Firebase is also doing more or less the same. And there is Azure Active Directory, your Azure uh, Active Directory in the cloud. And there are so much more. 
As mentioned before, you can subdivide this set into two subsets. The one subset is about on-premise products you can install locally, and the other subset is uh, a subset with identity as a service offers that run in the cloud. Most all of those offers are implementing a standard which is called OAuth 2. OAuth 2 has been developed at Twitter and Manolia, and the idea was to create a protocol to delegate restricted rights. So with OAuth 2, you can give your client restricted rights so that the client can act on behalf of you. Perhaps you give the client the right to write some invoices on behalf of you. Perhaps you give the client the right to send out informations about events on behalf of you. You don't have to give the client all your rights. You can just focus on a specific subset. When you think back at my metaphor about flighting, flying to Poland, then it's the same. When I got my ticket, my flight ticket, they gave me a subset of rights. I wasn't able to do anything, but I was able to get into the plane and to find my place within the plane. OAuth 2 is quite popular nowadays. It has been adopted by a huge amount of companies. For instance, by Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. And it provides several flows so that it covers different use cases. One important aspect here, it relies on HTTPS. It is just secure when you are using it on top of HTTPS. The flow that is intended for single page applications is called the implicit flow. And the good message here, the implicit flow is like the high level perspective I've presented before. When you are going with the implicit flow, you are redirecting the user to the authorization server. After the user logged in, he or she is redirected back to the client. The client gets an access token, and with this access token, the client can access the resource server. There is a very ugly but also easy attack on this. An attacker can skip part one of this. An attacker can start with step two by just sending an existing access token to the client. And when this client accepts this access token, the user will not act upon himself, but he or she will act upon the attacker. And of course, this is an issue. Just imagine the user is typing in secret things into the client, and let's imagine the user is sending those secret things, for instance, a credit card number to the resource server. In this case, those secret data is stored for the attack and not for the user, him or herself. So that's an ugly attack, but also a very popular attack. And there is also a very easy way to protect from this. You just use a nonce. A nonce is a random string. You just send this random string, this nonce, to the authorization server. And after this, the same nonce will be sent back from the authorization server. And then you just need to check whether you get the same nonce back from the authorization server. If this is the case, everything is okay. If you get another nonce back, then you are probably the victim of an attack. So this isn't defined by the standard, but this is a uh, widely adopted uh, addition to the standards that prevents from these attacks. Let's also talk about single sign-on. What we have seen before is a client that gets a token so that it can access the backend. But also the client needs to know who the user is. And there is also a workaround for this. The client could just access a request token that gives it the permission to read the user profile. And when it has this permission, it can just load the user profile from the resource server, look into it, and so it can find out who the user is. This has several issues. One issue is that the structure of the user profile isn't defined by OAuth 2. OAuth 2 isn't about resource servers. OAuth 2 isn't about user profiles. OAuth 2 is about exchanging tokens. 
That's why the O of do standard doesn't say anything about the structure of the user profile. That means we would end up with a vendor-specific solution when we would do this. This was the case about five years ago when websites started to do something like log in with Twitter, log in with Google, log in with Facebook. It has also a lot of additional drawbacks. For instance, there are some ugly security attacks when you are doing this. There is a better solution. This solution is called OIDC, or the long form is Open ID Connect. Open ID Connect is an extension for OAuth 2. It sits on top of OAuth 2 and it defines some additional stuff. For instance, it defines that the client not only gets an access token, but also an identity token, this blue token here. And the identity token is for the client. It shows the client who the user is and which properties the user has, which roles he or she has, or in which companies he or she works. And the access token is just to access the resource server on behalf of the current user. So we are ending up with two tokens. And in addition to that, OpenID Connect defines a user info endpoint. It's just the endpoint where the client can fetch further data about the user. And this endpoint is well defined, as well as the result of this endpoint, the JSON the endpoint returns, is also well defined by the OpenID Connect standard. This identity token here is a so-called JOT. JOT means JSON web token. It is just a JSON document that can be signed with a digital signature so that no one can fake it. Let's also talk a bit about social login. So a lot of people think it is quite easy to just exchange the authorization server with Google or Facebook. And on a technical area that would work, but it isn't the best idea. Please don't do this. Please don't use Google or Facebook directly as your authorization server. In this case, you are uh, creating the possibilities for a lot of ugly attacks. So don't try this at home. There are several reasons why this isn't a good idea. I'm just presenting you one reason, the most obvious one. The most obvious reason is you have two separate security domains. You have the security domain of Google, Facebook, Twitter and so on, on the one side, and you have your own security domain on the other side. And because of this, the tokens from their security domain don't contain the necessary data for yours. For instance, it isn't a good idea to enter a train with a flight ticket. So you see, with this obvious example, you have two separate security domains. You can't drive with the train just by showing them your flight ticket. Wouldn't be a good idea. You can't uh, use your driver's license to get into this conference. You have to buy a ticket for this conference. Another obvious sample uh, regarding this. And another thing why this isn't a good idea is that logging into Google means nothing for your application. Not everyone that has logged in with Google is author authenticated and has rights for your application. A lot of people has logins with Google and Facebook and not all of them shall have the rights to access your solution. So a better solution would be something like this. In this case, you have your own identity server. And in addition to that, you have something like Google and Facebook. And now the client redirects to your own authorization server. It redirects the user to Google, Facebook, and so on. And after the user logged in, it redirects you back to your own authorization server. And then your authorization server will create a token that fits into your security domain. For this, it could just look up some data in a database with additional information about you and your user account, additional information that make sense for your security domain. And then, of course, you can use those tokens as mentioned. So much for theory. We have seen some scenarios, also some attacks and risks. Let's come to practice. 
to show you everything in action, I have prepared a simple demonstration. It is using, of course, Angular. It is using a library that is called Angular O of 2 OpenID Connect. It's a library I've written some years ago. And since this summer, it is OpenID Connect certified. I'm quite proud of it. It took me some nights to uh, make all the tests pass. And I'm using Identity Server in the cloud, in the Azure cloud, which is a very nice and very adaptable .NET based solution. So let's have a look at this. Here I have my example. And I can log in into this example by clicking login. I'm redirected, so I hope to my identity server. So if the internet works, I should be redirected. So it's a lesson in patience, I think. So here we have identity server. And here I can decide whether I want to directly log in here or whether I want to log in with Facebook or something else. I'm saying, hey, I want to log in with my credentials, Max and my password. And after this, I'm redirected back to my solution. And this also seems to be a bit slow here with this conference's internet connection. So let's cross fingers again. We are back. My solution is hopefully reading the token and then nothing happens. Oh, yeah, well, cool. So the solution found out that I am the user Max Muster, which is the German counterpart of John Doe. And now I'm logged in. And here I have done something you shouldn't do at home. Please avoid this. I've just printed out my tokens to the website. This is just for the sake of demonstration. No one would do this because this would be a real security issue when everyone could just copy paste your token. But in this case, I will use these tokens to look into it. I am copying my identity token and I'm switching to a website that is called Jot.io. Yeah. Jot.io has been created by Op Zero, which is one of the identity as a service providers in the cloud I've mentioned before. And here I can copy paste my token into. And as we see, a token, especially this one here, consists of three parts. A red one, then this uh, violet one, and this darkies one. And those three parts are just base 64 encoded strings. And the decoded version of it is displayed on the right. So let's have a look at this. Here we see the header of our token. The header tells us that we have a chat. We've guessed this before. The header tells us about the cryptographic algorithms that are used to create a digital signature that uh, prevents the token from being faked. And here we have the fingerprint from the public key, uh, which is used to validate the signature. And then it comes to the payload. This is much more interesting. The payload contains a lot of flags that describe the current user. For instance, here we have the user ID. The user is just called subject in this case. We have the given name, we have the family name, we have the email address. And of course, you can put additional information into these tokens, additional informations you need to authenticate and to authorize the user in question. At the end, as mentioned, there is a digital signature and we can just validate the signature to find out whether the token is a real token or a fake token. I'm not doing this in here because the used library has already done this. Okay, after logging in, I can switch to book a flight. I can search for a flight, for instance, from Graz. This is the city in Austria I'm living in, to Hamburg, this city in Germany. And yeah, I'm getting one flight for seven uh, o'clock. So we have to be quite quick to catch these flights today. Mm -hmm. So let's also have a look into the network tab. Let's click to search. Let's trace the whole message. And here we see 
that as part of my request, let's zoom in a bit, as part of my request, the access token is sent over to the server. There is this HTTP authorization header and it contains the word bearer, which tells the server that now a token is coming and then we have our token. Okay. So let's have a look into the implementation of this. As everything is wrapped by a library, the implementation isn't that difficult. For instance, everything starts with uh, importing the OAuth module into my app module. And after this, I'm using this OAuth module inside my app component to configure everything. For instance, here I'm passing a um, auf configuration object, just a JSON-based object, an object literal to my configure method. This configure method just takes some data, data about the identity solutions, data about the URL of the identity solution and so on. After this, I'm telling my service that it shall validate the digital signature. For this, I'm hooking in a strategy, a validation handler, and then I'm telling the library that it should load some additional configuration data. Nowadays, all that OpenID Connect aware solutions out there are publishing a document with additional uh, configuration data. And this document I'm loading here, this document I'm using to configure my library. Yeah, and after this, I'm starting with logging in. In addition to that, I'm telling the library that the current token shall be refreshed when the session expires. Of course, a token has an expiration date and we don't want to throw the user out when this expiration date is reached. And because of this, the library will just request a new token in the background before the token expires. Okay, to put it in a nutshell, we just have to configure everything. We have to tell the library how it shall work, how it shall interact with the identity solution out there. This is the not funny part about this. Everything else is quite funny. For instance, when we look into our home component, logging in is just a matter of calling one method. I'm just grabbing my OAuth service by the means of dependency injection. Look at the constructor above. And then I'm calling uh, init implicit flow, which is starting the implicit flow we have seen before. Or oh, uh, locking out is also just a matter of calling one method. So you don't need to concentrate on this. You just need to call logout. When you want to read the claims, the fields within your identity uh, token, you can use get identity claims and it returns you an JavaScript hash, an object that contains all those data like the given name and the last name and so on. So let me just take some water. Okay. Well, in addition to that, I have also created an interceptor, an HTTP interceptor. Who has used interceptors before? Yeah, very nice. About a third or the half. Interceptors are a quite new concept in the world of Angular 2, 4, 5 and so on. They have also been a part of AngularJS 1.x and now with version 4.3 they have landed within Angular 4, 5 and so on. An interceptor is just a way to intercept all the outgoing HTTP requests and also to intercept all the incoming HTTP responses. And such an interceptor can mess with them. It can, uh, it can alter it. It can modify them. And here I have written an interceptor that is just adding the token to all outgoing requests so that we don't have to concentrate on this anymore. Let's have a look at this. This is my interceptor. 
For implementing an interceptor, you have just to implement the interface HTTP interceptor. As mentioned, it comes with Angular 4.3 and above. And such an implementation is also a service. Because of this, you have to use injectable, and you can use dependency injection to get hold of other data. Here I'm injecting my OAuth storage, which gives me access to the received access tokens. And in addition to that, I have to implement this intercept method. This intercept method is described by the HTTP interceptor, and it gets called for every outgoing request. And within this interceptor, I'm grabbing my URL, my request URL, and I'm looking at the URL to find out whether I'm accessing my web API. And only when I'm accessing my web API, I'm grabbing my access token out of the off storage. I'm creating this header we've seen before, this HTTP header with the name bearer in front, and then comes the token. And then I'm saying, hey, let's take the current request, let's take the current headers, and let's append another header to these headers. Let's append our authorization headers. The result of this is a new headers collection. And then I'm saying, hey, let's clone the former request and let's use the new headers for this cloned request. After this, I'm just calling next handle, which is uh, calling the next interceptor or uh, when there isn't another interceptor, which is triggering the HTTP request, the get request, the post request, and so on. Okay, so quite a simple solution to implement this cross-cutting concern in a central way. Of course, after this, you have to register your interceptor. And for this, you just need a provider. A provider that binds your interceptor to the token HTTP interceptors. And this provider is a multi-provider. That means there can be several such interfactors, uh, interceptors that are called uh, behind each other. I have used another Angular building block in here. For instance, when I'm locked out, yeah, when I'm locked out, I'm not allowed to use Bookerflight. You can't see it, but you can hear it. I'm not allowed to enter Bookerflight. So what do I do to prevent the user from accessing routes he isn't allowed to use? I'm using a guard and can activate guard, which is part of the router. Who has used can activate guards before? Okay, yeah, also about the half, perhaps a bit more. So let's have a look at this. My off guard is here, yeah. So a guard, one more time, is just a service that implements a given interface. The interface is called can activate. As it is a service, I can inject other services into it, and it comes with this can activate method. And this can activate method tells the router whether the current uh, routing transition is allowed or not. In this case, I'm just asking my off service whether there is a valid access token as well as a valid identity token. And when this holds true, I'm allowing authentication. Otherwise, I don't. This guy is also registered with my application. It needs to be registered with your routes. Can activate is the name of the property you are using for it. In addition to that, of course, you have also registered it as a service provider. Okay, so much for this. So much for theory. Let's come to a last topic that is very, very underrated nowadays. I've told you at the beginning, everyone is talking about single sign-on nowadays, but no one is talking about single sign-out. But single sign-out, of course, can increase the security of your application. Let's assume the user has been locked in with just one user account into two applications. 
And let's assume the user wants to log out from the first application. Here it is called application A or client A. In some situations, you want that the user is also logged out from the other client, which is called client B here. This isn't a good thing in every solution, but in some solutions you want definitely to go with single sign out to increase your security. So that means we need some way for the authorization server to inform client B that the user logged out. Or to, but to put it in another way, we need an open channel from the authorization server to the client, an open firewall safe channel. And for this, we could use something like WebSockets, which is quite a popular solution nowadays. We could use server sent events, or we could use the solutions from the 90s, the solutions of our fathers, and hidden iframe, a so-called forever frame. It is used in the internet as a workaround for years. And guess what? The Open ID Connect people just took this approach and put it into another document, into another standard. I think they are going with it because it just works everywhere with every browser. It isn't the solution we deserve, but sometimes, as you know from the Dark Knight, the solution we need. Who knows the Dark Knight? Who has seen the movie? Yeah, you are one of the good people. Nice. <laughs> So let's have a look at this. I've implemented this in my demonstration application. It's the most funniest demonstration. Let's load my application into two depths. Oh, come on. Check. Check. Let's log in here. Log in. Back and forth, yeah, now we're talking. I'm locked in here. I'm locked in there. So please look at this here. Welcome, Max Muster. And when I'm locking out here and I'm saying yes, then it takes some seconds and then, wow, I'm locked out at the other side. So I really like this example. I could just do it all the day. <laughs> it's my most favorite sample. <laughs> okay, nice. So let me just zoom up. Just give me one additional minute. So we have seen that tokens provide a lot of flexibility. They allow for cross-origin requests. They allow one service to pass the token to another one so that the other services know who you are. We have seen that OAuth 2 gives you a token so that you can access the backend on behalf of the user. And we have seen that OpenID Connect also gives you a token so that your application can find out who the user is. We have also seen that it is a good idea to use one token for each security domain. So please don't use tokens from Google within your security domain. Exchange them for another token. We have looked at the implicit flow. We have seen a demonstration application that is using implicit flow, and we have looked at single sign out. Please keep this metaphor with the token exchange in mind, for instance, with the passport and the ticket, because this is what everything here is about. Here you have my contact data. Feel free to reach out to me, and in the afternoon, I will upload my material and my slides to my blog. So thanks for coming, and have a nice conference. Thank you. <laughs>